in the heart of the Peruvian Amazon, along the banks of the Javadi River, the jungle pulses with a sacred magic. Skillfully crafted by the indigenous Matsus people, potent concoctions are produced. Mysterious ceremonial medicines capable of both healing and premonitory visions. Sapo or Cambo is burned for cleansing and to sharpen the senses. And Nunu allows the hunter to see through the eyes of the jungle, observe the future, and even project his spirit while he sleeps. Join us on this episode of Belief Hole as we explore the mystery and adventure of these controversial and mystical potions of Amazonia. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. Jury, in. close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Feldman. Magicians are demons, specters, and spirits, spooks. summonings, Sweet paralysis, paralysis. strange disappearances, sky whale phenomena, yes. alternative history, shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover-ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hi. Hello. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I try to do something different every time. I appreciate that. I like the little uh, You're spice. Welcome. You're welcome, Jeremy. A little spice from John there. We are the brothers of the belief hole. I am Jeremy. I am John. And I am Chris. And today we have a very, very special show for you guys. Different, I would say. I'm excited. A little different, a little warmer. Yeah, a little warmer. Oh, definitely warmer. We're going south, guys. We're going on an adventure. Yes, we're heading to the Amazon. The jungles of the Peruvian Amazon. <laughs> Not a moment too soon in this crappy weather. No, it is time to get out of frigid Ohio. It's gross. It's March too. It's that time when it's like, oh, it's it's warmer today. Oh, it's wet. Oh, it's wet. Oh, now it's raining. It was it was warm, but I can't. Oh, go now out anyway. tomorrow's thirty degrees again. Yeah, with a low of ten. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Harp. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that time of year. And just a quick reminder: if you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the like. What is it? Like subscribe bell. The like and subscribe. Wait, the subscribe bell notification the like, bell. The notification bell. We're so old. Whatever. <laughs> smash it tickle it smash that like button subscribe we appreciate you guys yeah i'm excited today guys i'm excited because we haven't talked about this kind of thing in a while when it comes to well, i don't want to say psychedelics because it's not really a psychedelic from what i understand it's more of a, a mystical combination of plants let's call okay we're today we'll, i guess i should introduce what we're talking about today Please. today we are talking about sapo and nunu New new. Mm -hmm. Is it that new new? It is that new new. For us, it is. These are what some might refer to as magical potions of the Amazon. That's really just what I refer to. I was going to say, who refers to them as that? <laughs> They're not actually potions. <laughs> They're uh, medicine. They're hunting medicine of the Amazon, specifically the Matsus people. There's a fantastic book that I will be referencing a lot in this episode, guys. You should go out and get it. Link in the show notes. It's called Sapo in My Soul by Peter Gorman. Now, this compound or medicine, if you will, it does, I mean, it is, you're right. It's not a magical potion per se, but it does have mystical properties. Yeah. I would argue that that's true, especially the connection with the indigenous Matsus people in Brazil, in the Peru, the Peruvian Amazon near the border of Brazil. They're very connected to the jungle, to nature there, to the natural medicines, the history of the biome there and working within it. And one of their tools in their arsenal for hunting and for life in general is sapo. We're about to get into what that is. And also Nunu. But these are two different medicinal... I, don't, I keep wanting to say potions just because I like that word. And it's, it sounds more magical. So but like a, it, um, it's a medicine. You said this term the other day. It's... um, What's the term? It's not pharmacological. Yeah. It's like ethnopharmacological. Ethnopharmacological compounds. Right. The compounds that are found in plants in this region. Well, ethno meaning of people, mm -hmm. I believe. So basically ethnopharmacology would be 
medicines of certain peoples. Gathering information and knowledge from indigenous peoples about the medicines they use, the drugs they use in nature. So for instance, Dennis McKenna, mm-hmm. Terrence McKenna's brother, he, I think he runs the McKenna Institute. I, Isn't it his son? No, it's no, his it's brother. brother. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Does he, he has a son too, right? I don't know. Terrence? Yeah. Terrence Jr.? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he does. But I, th- I think it's called the McKenna Institute, but essentially what they do, um, there was a great interview that Jordan Peterson actually did with Dennis McKenna called uh, Encountering Entities, which was just an interesting listen. But he was talking about the institute that he runs and essentially that's what they do, ethnopharmacology, where the goal is to try to collect as much knowledge about these indigenous tribes before they disappear, about their oh, right. you know, knowledge and bring it to the larger world so we can preserve it. I mean, that's how we've been making pharmaceuticals for good or ill, right? Oh, yeah. For hundreds and hundreds, decades. Right. Certainly. What, like Pfizer goes to the rainforest? and mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's that's where at least I remember. Well, then they, then they synthesize the I'm pretty sure I learned this in Doc, Patton at Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, I think is where I learned this, but I'm, uh-huh. didn't they, I mean. I mean, I would think not as much recently. They're, I'm sure some things are learned, but I think a lot of it's done in like a lab, isn't it at this point? Mm-hmm. But everything comes from something. The rainforest, the medicines that we get from. But things have been synthesized so many times outside of that. Yeah, I, I don't know how like, how often or how, like how much of that I think that's how it started. Yeah. That was where all all of it started from. I don't know. What yeah, I'm I don't. I don't either. <laughs> I, I could Google it. Well, there's a little bit we have. If we have time for it at the end of the episode, getting into the science from specifically Sapo from Peter Gorman and his work, working with actually the guy who discovered serotonin, oh. working with him on the amphibian peptides from the amphibian peptides from the frog, the Sapo, basically could potentially be a wonder drug. So there was a lot of interest from pharmaceutical companies from. Other types of lab research. Like it heals too many things. Well, there was... <laughs> Shut it down. There is a conspiracy actually in the book, which I don't think we'll have time to get to potentially or in the expansion, where he was contacted by someone. He went through all the vetting HR to make sure this person existed because he didn't want to give away one of his samples because he had so few of the sample of the SAPO. And he finally vetted, got the information. I believe he sent the sample. He talked to the vice president of this institution in Colorado somewhere. And then two weeks later, he got a call and she said, basically, she was on the run and that he was in a lot of danger for this because apparently they had a conflicting contract, something to that effect. Hmm. It doesn't sound unbelievable. So then yeah. he, he called HR again, and that same HR person he had talked to before to verify her employment told him, we have no record of that person working at the company. And then he asked about the vice president that he spoke to, and they had the same answer, we have no record of that person working it's at the company. It's a regular Bob Lazar situation. Anyway, so there's definitely, this is a potentially a very valuable medicine that has a lot of potential uses. We can get into that later, but I kind of just want to get into the story yeah. of the adventure in the jungle. Oh, I was going to say 25%. Or at least all modern Western drugs today are procured from the, the rainforest, the yeah. Amazon. Yes, rainforest. And some 120 prescription drugs sold worldwide today are derived directly from the rainforest. So a big chunk. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, how many, I would imagine there are greenhouses now here that are, have the jungle plants. Yeah, and like how long ago did that happen where they get like right. derivatives mm-hmm. from it? But yeah, I understand that most medicines start from yeah but i know what you're saying i don't know how often we're discovering new well that's why it's so i think valuable because there's still untold amounts of species yet to discover Uh and what we could learn from that the unique kind of compounds like Mm -hmm. for instance specifically the peptides in this in sapo the sapo frog well sapo technically means toad in spanish but anyways we'll get into that we'll get to the peptides and and the unlocking of the the medical possibilities towards the end of the episode but um and along with the controversy guys there's some controversy to the using this as well multiple different reasons for that But let's get into the adventure. Let's talk about the people and where this exists. So the book, fascinating book, really, really well-written. It's exciting. It's entertaining, but it's also just fascinating what he learned from these people and the experiences he had. So we're going to be diving into Sapo, also known as Cambo or Dao Kiet. Not sure if that pronunciation is right. There's a lot of words for this. This is a potent poison or medicine, depending on how you look at it. And this comes from a frog. Uh, Tree frog, right? Yeah, the name for it is the Philomedusa bicolor. Other names for it are the giant leaf frog, giant monkey frog, or waxy monkey tree frog. Now, this information, like I mentioned, is we're going to be covering this book from Peter Gorman and his adventures down there. I'm going to talk a little bit about him and who he is, but first I want to, I want to jump into the people of the Peruvian Amazon, specifically in this area of the jungle along the tributaries of the Rio Yavar. This is the home of the Matsus people. The Jaguar people. Oh, cool. Of the Peruvian jungle. Cool name. These guys, they're semi-nomadic, hunter-gathering tribe. Peter initially went down in the 80s, 85, 84, 85, 86. And then I think he spends three months a year there every year to this day. And a few years he was there all year. So he's there all the time. But initially when he first went, these people were very primitive in a sense. 
right? They hadn't been westernized. There was very little influence from the West on their indigenous culture. Acculturation, I think, is the word for it, when you kind of adapt to the world around you and start to lose that indigenous affect. Over the years, of course, it started to change. They started becoming less nomadic, more dependent on slash and burn agriculture and become more sedentary. But this starts at the beginning when he first goes down there and they're still very indigenous. Yeah, I saw a clip of a, one of the Matsus, is that how you say it? Yeah. Of a Matsus man who was talking about, he still remembered when they were uncontacted people. Uncontacted. He was saying how beautiful life was before they were contacted. Yeah. Well, they you would just move across the river to another spot to garden and then move back across. And then now they're, you know. They're more sedentary now. Yeah. So anyways, when he finds them, they don't trade. They don't have ceremonial dance. They're a very kind of basic people in tune with the earth itself in yeah. the wilderness, living day to day. What they do is hunt. <laughs> and they live in the harsh world of the lowland forests and swamps. You know, you're dealing with malaria, yellow fever, venomous snakes, of course, the jaguar. You got to know the land to survive. I imagine you have to be in tune. You have to be an expert. And they did. They mastered the flora and fauna of the region. And they thought of as you would have to in this existence, they thought of the earth as, as he said it, a benevolent tita or mother who provides for all their needs. So deeply connected the jungle and specifically looking at it through a lens of other tribes in the area. This comes from the book and this is how other tribes looked at the Matsus people. I said, quote, they say the Matsus can move like the wind and talk with the animals. They say the Matsus knows the jungle's secrets. Sapo is one of them. Yeah, this is what's cool. This is what's crazy is that the use of these sort of mystical compounds that they've discovered, however many millennia ago or whatever. Think about in the family of ayahuasca as far as like a natural rainforest based right. medicine that has some sort of mystical properties. Yeah, which allows them to be even more in tune with the jungle than neighboring tribes, according to neighboring tribes. They're right. They're visionaries. Exactly. Well, that, that's what this is all about. It's about connecting to the wilderness, the jungle, mm -hmm. the animals in the jungle to become a better hunter using these- It's a shamanistic thing. It is shamanistic, especially the Nunu, which we'll get into. What's great is the guy who goes down here, Peter Gorman, he gets to experience this firsthand and has a couple of these experiences that proves to him that this is a real phenomenon using these compounds. Well, he's the first one to discover. I mean, it's not, he didn't discover it. Obviously it's an ancient, yeah. we don't know how far it goes back. He's the first one to bring it back. Hey, we don't know how far it goes back with the Matsus people, but yeah, first one to bring it back and talk about it, which angered a lot of people actually, which is kind of funny. We'll get into that. But the reason that this entho-pharmacological pursuit is so important is because of the loss of the land of the indigenous people. As of the date of writing the book, which I think was 2015, um, we're losing an average of one tribe a year in the Amazon alone wow. to acculturation. Acculturation, which is like adapting to the becoming more westernized, disease or destruction of the land and the forest around it. So imagine the knowledge, especially as, you know, he was talking about some of the Matsus people uh, as they became more acculturated and they were working with missionaries. There would be parts of their belief system or their medicines or their way of life that they would start to not talk about anymore because it went against what they were being told how they should live. For instance, they would say like, oh, I only have one wife because that's what the missionaries said. Oh, right. should probably not have more than one wife. When in reality, they just wouldn't tell the truth because they didn't want to, you know, right. cause any problems. So you lose some of the authenticity of how they lived over time. Well, you got to think too, like imagine the history you lose if it's a word of mouth history. It's passed on from generation to generation. If that goes away as they get more globalized. Because the next generation changes and you get the Zoomers in there. <laughs> yeah. The Zoomer Matsus with their iPhones and TikTok. Ugh, it's on its way. Yeah, I don't think that's happening there yet. Oh, it is. It's on its way. It's <laughs> everywhere, TikTok. Boom, boom in the pocket. Boom, boom in the pocket. <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> Sounds really weird. Figure it out. Um, I can't. Okay, so let's get into the adventure here. So Peter, he is a volunteer for the American Museum of Natural History. There he is. He's down there at this time. This is 1985. He's collecting artifacts. This is his second trip to the Peruvian Amazon. So if you go to the Natural American History Museum now in New York, and you go to the indigenous peoples of South America section, whatever that's called. The American Museum of Natural History's Hall of South American Peoples. You'll see some of his stuff there. Oh, cool. He actually was procuring that stuff for the museum, but he was also studying, gathering food, plant identification, just gathering this information. And he's on this journey with his friend Moises, this guy who would become his friend, who is a jungle survival guide, but he also was previously in the military down there. So they're out there, they're doing their stuff, right? On the river, on the Rio Akayaku River. Kind of looks like Shia LaBeouf in that Honey Boy movie. <laughs> oh, in that picture? Yeah, which I haven't seen. But he does, but more handsome. 
Good looking rogue on the river. That's crazy. We will have pictures in the show notes, guys. There's a lot of great pictures from the book that he's taken over the years. So they're out there working on the river, collecting samples and, and studying, learning about the area for the museum. And that's when some local hunters they run into tell them that they've seen signs of a family of Matsus people in the area. And again, as of this time, they're very, you know, not a lot of contact with these people at all. Peter's never come in contact with them before. And at this time, his guide, Moises, is like, okay, we have to find a way to make contact with these people. He tells him he was once in a military force that was tasked with containing the Matsus people because the Matsus apparently had committed several raids on the river towns hmm. in the area. And he said that basically they fought them with just spears and arrows against their automatic weaponry, whether it was guns or whatever, fought with immense courage, et cetera. Basically, these people are fierce. And if we have a chance to meet with them or observe them, we definitely need to. So they decide, okay, we're going to camp in the area and just hope for an interaction. So at this point, is he just down there to collect artifacts, basically? Yeah. Okay. And plant knowledge, that kind of right. stuff for the museum. But of course, anthropological opportunities arise. And right. You want to meet people like this. So they're camping out. This is such a great and weird story in this book. There's so many cool little intense stories in this book. You'll find if you guys get this book, it's really good. But so they're camping out in the area where the Matsus are. And then two days into camping, a young Matsus hunter comes into the camp carrying like his bow and arrow. And he borrows a shotgun from Moises, his guide. Moises gives him two shotgun shells. The guy disappears into the jungle. Two gunshots ring out. He comes back with two wounded spider monkeys in a palm leaf basket hanging on his back. And imagine this, he's got a baby spider monkey, assuming the baby of the two spider monkeys that were killed, hanging in his hair, Aww. right? He returns the gun, drops off one of the wounded spider monkeys as a gift or a thank you to Peter and Moises, disappears into the forest. They follow him back to his camp to kind of observe him. He gives the remaining adult monkey to a woman who just begins to roast it over the fire. I guess apparently obli yeah. oblivious to its cries. So this thing's alive while they're cooking it. Oh, man. And he gives the baby monkey to a young woman who's nursing her own child. Without hesitation, the young mother takes the baby spider monkey and begins to nurse it. So you have what? one woman of the tribe roasting a still live spider monkey over the fire while it's crying out and the other spider monkey is being nursed by one of the so wow, crazy this is a great quote from the book that describes kind of his intense reaction to that scene he said those dual images peter speaking those dual images represented a combination of cruelty and compassion i'd never imagined and taught me more about the reality of the jungle than anything i had previously experienced more than that those images would compel me to return to the matzis again and again fascinating yeah be crazy to see that very intense. So you are in the thick of it, of raw nature. These people that live so ingrained with nature, with both with the cruelty and compassion of nature, uh, and just experiencing that, that would be super intense. So now it's 1986. Here is the scene where Peter first meets Pablo. Pablo becomes his very close friend in the Matsus community. Pablo is the guy responsible for showing him Sapo, for showing him Nunu, the hunting snuff with its visionary properties. You know, it's really weird as I, I was going to ask you, or I was at some point going to talk about Campo. Campo. Yeah. That's Sapo. It's the same thing. Yeah. I actually just watched a video the other day. Really? On this guy called Jeff Mara. Uh huh. He has a podcast that he, it's a lot of near death experiences, but a lot of weird stuff too, yeah. like UFO people. And this guy claims that he can summon UFOs at will. With Campo? No, but. Later, he talks about Campo. Okay. Cambo. Cambo. Cambo, is that I think it's it? Combo? Combo. Some, something like that. But anyway, he had like footage of this, of these saucers and stuff like that. Oh, crazy. Like a Greer situation, kind of? Yeah, kind Steven of Greer. like that. But he later, he gets into this, it's Sapo. I didn't realize that, but he basically, I mean, you'll probably get into it. You know, you like burn it into your skin. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly, yeah. It's just so weird that I, so that is a synchronicity. I haven't had one in a long there time. There you go, John. <laughs> there you go. Synchronicities abound. And I actually, when I watched that video, I was like, maybe synchronicities are real. When I, Because I was listening to him talk and he talks a lot about synchronicities and just been so long since I've had one. But And we were just talking about doing an episode on synchronicities, finally. Yeah. It's just weird that that's the same. Same thing we're covering today. Stuff that we're talking about, yeah. The expansion, we'll get into a little bit of that because there was multiple expansion synchronicities popping off. So that's a good sign. It means we are in the flow I kind of want to do it. Sapo? We haven't got there yet. Yeah, let's get to what it is. We're going to tell some stories now from the perspective of Peter and his experiences with Sapo and Nunu. John, you probably haven't heard of Nunu yet. This to me is the most fascinating of the two. It has a different kind of purpose, yeah. but they work together because it's a clairvoyant sort of compound. Yes. 
This is really, really cool. Is um, that this here? Yeah. So this I call Nunu the first ride. All right. This is Peter's first experience. This takes place in 1986 when he first meets Pablo. This takes place in Mashu's hut. I believe Mashu is Pablo's main wife. I think he has a few others, but this is, this is the main one. After dinner, Alberto joined us in Mashu's hut, and Pablo produced an old brown beer bottle and a hollow reed tube. From the bottle, he poured a fine green powder into his hand and worked it into one end of the tube. Alberto put the other end of the tube to his nose, and Pablo blew the powder into one of his nostrils. They repeated the process several times, alternating the nostrils receiving the snuff. Moises explained that the powder was Nunu and that Matza's hunters used it to have visions of where to hunt. He said that after the visions, they would go to the place they'd seen and wait for the animals in the vision to appear. I told him he was dreaming, but he insisted that was what would happen and pressed Pablo to give me some. A few minutes later, the tube was put to my nose. When the Nunu hit, it seemed to explode inside my face. It burned my nostrils and I began to choke up wretched green phlegm. Over and over, Pablo blew the snuff, maybe 10 to 12 times in each nostril. The initial pain began to subside and Moises encouraged me to keep the snuff up in my nostrils, not to blow it out or swallow it. It was difficult at first, but I soon began to get the hang of it. I closed my eyes. Out of the blackness, I began to have visions of animals, tapir, monkey, wild boar, that I saw more clearly than my limited experience with them should have allowed. Suddenly, unexpectedly, a group of boars stampeded in front of me. That is all the vision. As I watched them thunder through my field of vision, several began to fall. Moments later, the visions faded and a pleasant sort of drunkenness washed over me. Moises asked what I'd seen and whether I recognized the place where the vision happened. I told him it looked like the place where we'd eaten lunch earlier in the day before we reached Pablo's camp. He asked what time it was in the vision, and I told him that the sun was shining, but mist still shrouded the trees. He put the time between 7 and 8 a.m. Despite my suspicion that I'd invented the entire vision, Moises told the Matsis what I'd seen. At dawn the next morning, several of us piled into our boat and headed downriver toward the spot I described. Pablo was restless to get going, apparently upset that I was not moving quickly enough. As we neared the spot, I was astounded to see a dozen or more boars burst from the underbrush at river's edge and charge across the river just in front of us. We jumped out of the boat and chased them. Several ran into a hollow log and Pablo, Alberto, and a couple of the older boys quickly blocked the ends with thick branches to keep them from escaping. With the boars trapped, Pablo and Alberto each fashioned nooses out of vines tied to strong sticks. Holes were cut into the top of the log with a machete. The nooses slipped through them. One by one, the boars were pulled, dead, from the log. At some point, Alberto passed me a noose. It took me a few minutes to get it around the neck of one of the remaining boars. Once I had it, I pulled the noose tight. I had no idea how hard the animal would fight and wished I could just let it go free. That was not my call to make, so I pulled and felt the life begin to leave the animal. It took several minutes to finally kill it. We returned to the Pueblo with seven boars, each weighing about 25 to 30 pounds, enough meat for the entire village for four days. Thank you, Nunu. Pretty crazy, yeah. Handy tool to have. So essentially, this is a snuff mm -hmm. blown through a bamboo shoot into each other's nose. And what's interesting too is this snuff, I think it's made from tobacco and the inside bark of the cacao tree or another type of tree I think can be used too. So this is not from the frog. No, this is a snuff that's from plants, specifically that inner bark and tobacco, something like that. And it's cooked, made into a powder blown into each other's noses back and forth. And the idea is that when you're blowing it, you're also blowing the essence of the hunter. Oh, interesting. So you have to put your essence into it. In fact, there's a point where, you know, he's doing the new new with Pablo, Peter is, and Pablo stops or gets frustrated because he's not blowing his essence. He's just blowing the snuff. Peter said it took him a long time before he started to actually understand how to blow his essence <laughs> out with the snuff. It's probably like intention-based, right? Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me. 
just fascinating. Wow, that's really interesting. And then you can pick that up as the receiver. Hmm. As someone who's not a hunter doing it, I wonder mm-hmm. if the effect would be different. It oh. becomes worse. Yeah, he's like not he's not great at hunting, but <laughs> he's You're giving me the bad ass. He's really good at like, I don't know, like writing or something. Yeah. I think just intention in general maybe is part of it. Yeah. Whether or not you're a consummate hunter. It's interesting when they just cause I think you have a spot later where he describes even further what the vision is like seeing between the leaves, seeing it's almost like a Yeah, what Nunu new new does for yeah. you. Yeah, it is a visionary medicine. You know, the idea is that you're seeing as in the story here, you're seeing in your mind's eye where the animals will be. It's telling you basically a premonition of the future yeah. of where the animals are going to be. What animals and where. So you can go there and prepare to trap it or hunt it, whatever you have to do. It's used to great effect. In fact, Peter was skeptical, but then after having this experience and all the other times that he experienced it, he couldn't deny the veracity of, of the vision of how Nunu works. Yeah. It's like these plants, the same with like mushrooms, they have like an intelligence. Yeah. yeah. They pass on as you ingest or... Yeah, very strange. Like they share the information of the natural world around you, connected. <laughs> like what? It just like, what are the mechanisms that allow that to happen? Yeah. It really makes the world seem so magical. Yeah. You consider that. Invisible mechanisms to us, for sure. Even psychedelics, themselves, like haven't been studied that much, I feel like, compared to what yeah, we're just the now experiences that you can have with things like DMT and... Yeah. Psilocybin. They are magical in a way. And I mean, anyone that's taken them, especially like at higher doses, talks about being accompanied by other beings and entities. And that's, you know, it's just science doesn't really have a whole lot of interest in talking about things like that. Yeah. Even if they study it scientifically, right? Yeah. they'd never be like, it is a gateway to another dimension. Maybe they would be someday, but. Yeah. I mean, it's usually talked about as like an archetype of the right. mass unconscious, the Jungian idea that you're experiencing something, it's inside you. But how does that work with something like this, where it's like, well, this it's obviously... You're right, it doesn't work with this, with the new new. Yeah. The, the visionary where you're seeing where animals are going to be. Right. Is that coincidence? Yeah. But it happens so frequently that it's used as a tool in their arsenal. How does it even know where the animals are going to be in the future? And that's a great question. I just, I read recently, there's a study somewhere that's being done, I think it's DMT, I'm pretty sure it's DMT. But they're trying to do a scientific study, probably a university or something, probably some parapsychological unit with, you know, a botanist unit. I don't know who's doing it, but where they're trying, the the purpose of the study is to see if they can get a pattern of personalities visited within the DMT trip. So characteristics Mm. of the entities that people are seeing, if they can get sort of a blind study on people who are unfamiliar with what the stereotypes are. And see if they can get a pattern to match up. I forget. I'll have to look that up, but I just read about it recently. Interesting. Um, so there are some people that are definitely, but who knows how on the fringe that they are looked at in the academia. Yeah. So you're talking about like a, a key or a legend for a map of personalities in the DMT. Well, realm. just to point to the, that it's a shared experience. Oh, right. Yeah. You know, because then it's harder to cast that away as just a hallucinatory, you know, vision. Do they talk at all about, does it work every time? So there is a, a point later where it gets more difficult because the river rises and the hunting becomes really difficult in the area. So they have to start switching from hunting to trapping. There's a great story I have coming up with a tapir that they have to trap. So he uses the Nunu in a fascinating way. Pedro does. Oh yeah, that's what I was, the Nunu is the, it's the snuff. When used in combination, the sapo heightens your senses so much that you can, it reminds me of an aspect of psilocybin where, it, this isn't psychedelic, but where psilocybin, you, you, you see more detail in vegetation or whatever, you know, right. things seem to pop more. You, you can, well, they would use it, yeah, to like, your vision gets better. Right. And in the same way, the sapo, which you'll be getting into here, is where it kind of cleanses you so that you're purged. You can see through the forest in a way that you couldn't before and see the, the game. Yeah. Let's get to the sapo, because this is the chief topic of our episode. The Nunu is an experience building up to his sapo experience. And then once we know what sapo is, I'll explain how they collect the sapo from the frog and how it works together which is fascinating. And then later on, we'll be getting into some of the controversy and the medicines that can be used and the potential people have talked about several deaths from Sapo. So it's not a perfect medicine. All medicines can be dangerous. So we'll get into that, but let's get into the Sapo experience. So the next morning after the hunt that we just experienced, Peter's with Pablo and Steve, who is Peter's brother-in-law and also the photographer for this adventure. Moises, the survival guide fella is there as well. And they're kind of an interesting point. They're just chilling out. Peter is talking to Pedro when they can't speak the same language. They both don't know Spanish very well. Peter knows some Matzis words. Pablo doesn't know any words in English. So part of his purpose here is to translate certain words using phonetics, pointing to things like, you know, pot or broom or whatever. At this point, Pablo is very bored. 
This is not a very fun activity for him. That is until he points to a small leaf bag hanging over the fire. That's when Pablo looks up and says, with his eyes brightening, Sapo. And this is the experience of Peter trying Sapo for the first time, and also the first recorded experience of anyone using Sapo for the first time. That was when he pulled a piece of split bamboo, roughly the size and shape of a doctor's tongue depressor from the bag. It was covered with what looked like a thick coat of aging varnish. Sapo, he repeated, scraping some of the material from the stick with a piece of a broken machete and mixing it with saliva. When he was finished, it had the consistency and color of yellow-green mustard. Then he pulled a twig from the same bag that held the bamboo splint, which I later learned was tamishi, a strong, thin vine used to tie beams to posts when building jungle huts, and the vine traditionally used to make sapo burns, grabbed my left wrist and burned the inside of my forearm. I pulled away, but he held my wrist tightly. The burn mark was about the size of a large wooden match head, I looked at Moises and asked what was happening. Una nueva medicina nunca he visto, he said, shaking his head. A new medicine. I've never seen it. Remembering the extraordinary experience I had with Nunu, I let Pablo burn my arm a second time. He scraped away the burned skin, then dabbed a little of the sapo onto the exposed areas. Instantly, my body began to heat up. In seconds, I was burning from the inside and regretted allowing him to give a medicine I knew nothing about. I began to sweat. My blood began to race. My heart pounded. I became acutely aware of every vein and artery in my body and can feel them opening to allow for the fantastic pulse of my blood. My stomach cramped and I vomited violently. I lost control of my bodily functions and began to urinate and defecate. I fell to the ground. Then unexpectedly, I found myself growling and moving about on all fours. I felt as though animals were passing through me, trying to express themselves through my body. It was a fantastic feeling, but it passed quickly, and I could think of nothing but the rushing of my blood. A sensation so intense that I thought my heart would burst. For perhaps 15 minutes, the rushing got faster and faster. I was in agony. The pain became so great that I wish I would die just to get it over with. But I didn't die, and the pounding slowly became steady and rhythmic. I gasped for breath, and when it finally subsided altogether, I was overcome with exhaustion. I slept where I was. When I awoke a few hours later, I heard voices. But as I came to my senses, I realized I was alone. I looked around and saw I had been washed off, carried to the unwalled hut Steve and I were using, and put into my hammock. I stood and walked to the edge of the hut's platform floor and realized that the conversation I was overhearing was between two of Pablo's wives who were standing nearly 20 yards away. I didn't understand their dialect, of course, but I was surprised even to hear them from that distance. I walked to the other side of the platform and looked out into the jungle, and its noises too were clearer than usual. And it wasn't just my hearing that had been improved. My vision, my sense of smell, everything about me felt larger than life, and my body felt immensely strong. When I saw Pablo later that evening, I explained what I was feeling. With hand gestures as much as language, he smiled. Be Rambo Sapo, he said. Fuerte. It was good Sapo strong. So that, in a nutshell, is the Sapo experience. That's crazy. I mean, it sounds like the benefits are pretty remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not something to be... It's funny, because it doesn't seem like he really knew what he was getting into. No. Which would be kind of hard. Yeah. At the time, I think he was the first Westerner to try this. Oh, you're talking about Peter, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had no idea. He had the Nunu, which was awesome, basically. Like, you get kind of drunk and you see animals. (laughs) And then he's like, oh, great. So then they burn a little spot on your arm scrape the flesh away, and then put the sapo mixed with saliva, spit, it looks just like wasabi, mustard essentially, right into the bloodstream because you have the exposed blood vessels there under the skin. Adult male would do three to four. It's like an average kind of starting. 
but they put it all on you before it starts to hit. So you get it all at once. And yeah, you don't know what's happening, especially since he's the first Westerner to yeah. experience this. So he's dying. He feels like he's dying. I mean, it is, it's a that sounds tremendous agonizing. agony you go through. But of course, the benefits of that are things like the sustained feeling of strength for, for days. Apparently he and uh, Steve, his brother-in-law, who also did it, they would go days without being hungry or thirsty. They could, as he said, move through the jungle for hours without tiring. It's like your newborn babe. Yeah, it kind of like from the guy that I heard about it from, it's like, it just cleanses everything out of your body. Absolutely. Like your spiritual body, your mental body, and your like physical body. He said he's done it with people that were like alcoholics. Yeah. It depends on what problems people have, but the stuff that they'll throw up is really differently colored. Yeah. And they'll just barf out all that negative energy mixed with all whatever physical backing up you have. Yeah. And it, it creates this completely like clear vision. And that sounds like a really strong dose because yeah. the stories that I heard weren't quite like people didn't think they were dying, but they would, you know, vomit for a long period of time. You know, a couple, it'd be a couple rounds of that. I think yeah. there, because I saw, it was like a short clip I saw the other night. It was like a, a Playboy video clip or something. It was like a sort of a, a voxing, but Playboy. Huh. And they had this girl do it. It was with these like Western shaman type people who were kind of like, you know, yuppie hippie type folks. So I'm guessing that people that do it stateside, they probably water it down a little bit or make it, yeah. they're making sure they're lighter doses. When you're well, in the middle of the Amazon doing it with a guy there who's, you know, there have been, they're doing it with healthy hunter people. They probably want to get the, the strong dose yeah, of it. And they're know? used to it. They know what to expect. And they need it for helping the hunt. Then that's one of the things too, is kind of the controversy of it is there have been deaths in the West. Oh, really? Imagine if you have hypertension. I guess it doesn't sound like it'd be great. Yeah, it seems like an extreme toll on the body. Yeah, so yeah for you're... sure. And we'll get to that later in the episode. But essentially, one of the arguments is that it's become very popular, especially in California. Yeah. South Ayahuasca thing. Yeah. So they have, quote unquote, licensed practitioners. But some people may not be as careful as others. And some people say, like, you really need to be doing it with the indigenous people that know what they're doing, that have been doing this for generations. Or at least people that have a lot of experience. Yeah, for it. sure. I mean, there's gray area for sure. This is just what some people... Not like a coffee shop opening up. Yeah, exactly. Let's try some sapo today. It's not something you want to just go into. Right. Yeah. So we should get some, right? I would definitely think so. I would, but I, I would like to do... <laughs> right after. I'd like to go down to the Amazon, take like a seven-hour boat ride on the river... And go to Peter Gorman's little pad on the river there. He, I think he's still super doing intense. it. He's still oh, really? doing sapo for people. That's cool. It would be a wild yeah. culture shock for sure. Go down there for a bleeful episode. Well, after all that talk of purging, I feel like I could use a, a bathroom break. Well, let me just finish with the, some of the effects here because I think this is interesting. The lasting effects. Sorry, that's really gross. So, <laughs> that is, are you going to go purge? I was, I was just trying to be colorful in my break announcement. So again, every sense you have is heightened after this. He experienced feeling in tune with the environment as though, quote, Sapo put the rhythm of the jungle into my blood. That's awesome. It does sound kind of like a psychedelic to some degree. But well, yeah, some people have even said, I mean, you can see how that would give you an altered state of consciousness, yeah. just being purged of all of the gunk in your body. Some people believe that there is some DMT component. I don't know whether you experience that hallucinogenically or if there's just some other kind of way you experience it, but some people have said they felt that. Well, he said he's for a moment there was, it was as if animals were running through him. Yeah. Well, that, and that's, that is one of the more mystical things about it. Later, when he sends a sample to the Nobel Prize nominee, I, I don't know if I mentioned his name yet, it's like a spermer or something. We'll get to that. But he can account for every single thing that he experienced in his sapo purging, essentially, by analyzing it, looking at the peptides and everything. The only thing that he couldn't account for was the more mystical aspect. He couldn't, couldn't explain, couldn't it explain away. the connection with the animals in the jungle. And so that leaves this door open to the further mystery of the connection. Oh, and it also goes to the mystery of these frogs mm -hmm. that produce the sapo, which we're about to explain how that happens after the break. They also don't produce sapo in captivity. That's interesting. They don't know what the frog is eating that is allowing them to create the sapo inside this mystical kind of compound. They've analyzed in captivity, feeding it different things, and even studying it outside, but they can't figure out what it is that is creating it. Maybe they have to be in the wild in order to create it. Maybe well, they have to be connected to the jungle. Yeah, that's interesting that there's nothing in the compound that would be hallucinogenic, right? It's almost like if it is a more mystical thing that you have to be in the jungle connected to the land, maybe connected with the people that are using it and have been using it for centuries to have that moment where the animals are rushing through you. Exactly. It's like it's in concert with the new new. It has to be experienced environmentally. Yeah. In a sense, in that eco state. Yeah, that is awesome. Really interestingly, this kind of also goes to the mystical aspect to it is that he claims this allowed him to see animals before the animals saw him. Ooh. Went out in the jungle and hunting. 
Another thing that this allowed him to do, allegedly, is sense which plants were benevolent and which ones mm, interesting. Yeah. would be poisonous. Of course, increased stamina during long hunts, sharpening all the senses, why the hunters use it. And in large doses, the Matsus people would say it would make a Matsus hunter, quote, invisible. What? And by this, they don't mean like disappear, but oh. to poor sighted but acute smelling jungle animals by eliminating the human odor. Ooh. When you purge all that out of you, you're also eliminating any scent or smell you had that you brought with you. With Diet Pepsi and With Diet Taco Pepsi Bell. and Taco Bell. <laughs> you know, the great things that we enjoy in, in quote, civilization. Slim Jims. Slim Jims. Anyway, so this is all out of you. You've purged it out of you. Uh, they wouldn't be purging that, of course, the Matsus people. Mm-hmm. But whatever else that was human right. would be purged out of them. Uh, and then you're just with the jungle. You, you are the smell, the scent of the jungle. You're cleansed in that way. I want to be one with the jungle. And of course, on top of that, as a medicine. So specifically using it as a tonic to cleanse the body of any kind of toxins, mm-hmm. toxin purging uh, for people with illness. In fact, Peter himself said that he has an anecdote in his book about, you know, he's had flesh eating disease. He's had malaria, yellow fever, all the different things you could consider getting there. He said uh, flesh eating spider bites and everything. And he says some of those he had to get operations for or whatever. Uh, he doesn't think he would have survived had he not been regular doing Sapo. And of course that's anecdotal in his yeah. experience, but I imagine you're doing this stuff regularly, you know, what is it? Three times a month or every three months, whatever he's doing, uh, you get a sense for how it's affecting your body on a regular basis. Well, it just makes logical sense too. If you don't have all the garbage in your system that you would normally have from years of body mistreatment, you know, if you've expelled all that, I would imagine you would do better when you're, when you experience a potentially fatal situation with a poisonous bite or something. Yes. And speaking of expelling things from your body to avoid a potentially fatal situation, it's time for a bathroom break. Chris, before we go to break, what's coming up in the expansion today? Oh my hard left turn. This is going to be a hard left turn, but I'm excited about it. It's going to be fun because it's going to be just fun. We are going to be doing adventures in psychometry, John. So you gave me this idea. Oh, cool. And... A totally <laughs> separate, I mean, not totally separate because I was brought down. What a rousing enthusiasm. I was, <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> I was brought through synchronicity to a different topic. I started on the road of psychometry and I ended up on Pennsylvania Avenue at Lincoln's Supernatural White House. So we're going to get into some really interesting stuff. Abraham Lincoln? A- the Abraham Lincoln. Interesting. It sounds like an interesting grab bag of phenomena. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So Lincoln's here, what are you going to be talking about? Like some of the weird synchronicities with his death or, or the spirituality with Mary Todd. Right. And a lot of people have heard a lot of that before to some degree, at least in the rumor mill, it was people sit around the water cooler and talk about Abe Lincoln's presidency. That happens a lot, <laughs> but you know, I've heard it you all. hear about Mary Todd being into uh, seances when, you know, her children died and she went through some mania, mm-hmm. a bit of that. But we, we're going to hear about Lincoln himself and his potentially abilities in clairvoyance and oh, fascinating divination but this all came because john mentioned he was interested in uh, psychometry and i had a great book from hans holzer on psychometry and he went into detail about abe lincoln's presence. what is psychometry psychometry yeah for those of you who don't know is the ability to touch an object and read into the past of how emotions or emotions from situations or events were imprinted onto the object. Oh, it's like stone tape theory, but with regular objects. Yeah. Sort of. Sort of, yes. We're going to get into that. It's, it's going to be a really interesting episode. Interesting. And a lot of fun. Awesome. So if you guys don't know, if you're new to the belief hole, we have this special thing called the expansion. Yes. Expansion experience. It's basically like a whole nother side of the show. Mm-hmm. We're getting close to a hundred episodes over there, I think, yeah. aren't we? It's mm-hmm. the show's doppelganger. It's yeah. pretty much all the content you'd want Full produced episodes, sound design, story told, produced, researched. Every time we release a main episode, we release an expansion. Boom. So if you guys are out of content and you're waiting for, you're hungry for more, head to beliefhold.com, hit the expansion button. Yes. And sign up. Big red button. Join the growing community over there. Yes. Join us in the hole. And with that, here is a preview of this week's expansion episode. Access granted. One of the most widely quoted psychic experiences you could call it Abraham Lincoln had and involved a strange dream he had a few days, just a few days before his death. Jeremy, will you introduce the story? And then John, I'll have you read Lincoln's relation of the account. When his strangely thoughtful countenance gave Mrs. Lincoln cause to worry, he finally admitted that he had been disturbed by an unusually detailed dream. Urged over dinner to confide his dream, he did so in the presence of Ward Hill Lamon close friend and social secretary, as well as a kind of bodyguard. Lamon wrote it down 
immediately afterward, and it's contained in his biography of Lincoln. About ten days ago, I retired very late. I had been up waiting for important dispatches from the front. I could not have been long in bed when I fell into a slumber, for I was weary. I soon began to dream. There seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. Then I heard subdued sobs, as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I left my bed and wandered downstairs. There the silence was broken by the same pitiful sobbing, but the mourners were invisible. I went from room to room, no living person was in sight, but the same mournful sounds of distress met me as I passed along. It was light in all the rooms. Every object was familiar to me, but where were all the people who were grieving as if their hearts would break? I was puzzled and alarmed. What could be the meaning of all this? Determined to find the cause of a state of things so mysterious and so shocking, I kept on until I arrived at the east room which I entered. There I met with a sickening surprise. Before me was a catafalque on which rested a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments. Around it were stationed soldiers who were acting as guards, and there was a throng of people, some gazing mournfully upon the corpse, whose face was covered, others weeping pitifully. Who is dead in the White House? I demanded of one of the soldiers. The president was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. Then there came a loud burst of grief from the crowd, which awoke me from my dream. I slept no more that night. And we're back. Welcome to the jungle. We've got fun and games. Yes, we do. And they're called Sapo and Nunu. <laughs> nice. So I'd like to paint a picture of the collection of the Sapo or Combo or Dao Kiet. Poor little frog. This is the poor little frog. We'll have an image of this in the show notes. Is it alive? Yeah. So I have read some comments that, oh, well, at least I read one comment of someone who said this is torture for the frog, et cetera, et cetera. But you guys be the judge. It's certainly not good for them. Well, it's definitely not their natural state. So this is what, <laughs> this is what it looks like. Can you imagine if a human was in that position? Yeah. Well, it, that could be a therapy. It's like though. your stretcher upstairs. Yeah, it's like your stretcher. <laughs> this frog's like, this is not good for it's me. N- not what I want. It's wanted. not going to end well. Oh, maybe it's like being pet, petted for him, you know. So this, I'm painting a picture in your guys' head if you can't see this. Frogs don't have feelings anyways. For those audio listeners, lies, John. Someone's going to respond to that angrily. So he doesn't mean it. I have a friend who's a frog, sir. <laughs> and he has a lot of feelings. All animals have feelings. So you got four sticks stuck in the ground. This is how they procure the sapo. They take four sticks, stick them in the ground. These are your stints, your supports, essentially. Then they, the Matsus people, they tear thin fibers out of palm leaves. Very gingerly, they tie one end to the frog's legs. Frog's alive. They tie one end to the frog's legs, the other end to the, these sticks stuck in the ground. And Peter describes it once the, the frog is suspended in midair with these fibers connected to these sticks. It looks like a, quote, strange green trampoline. <laughs> this frog just kind of hovering there attached to these going, nope, 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 <laughs> yeah nope. they have a specific kind of bark i was going to try to find a sample of that i don't know if, if we can but is it the frog called sapo sapo frog yeah and so sapo actually means toad in spanish but the, oh. the, the matzas people didn't have like a strong grasp of spanish so they called everything sapo oh toads frogs whatever but yeah so sapo is the okay. the frog it's also the phylomedusa bicolor it's called i read the whole book so i read that word like 10 times i remember it Good job. Thank you. Smart now. <laughs> Jerry's uh, second book. <laughs> second book I've read. <laughs> like we need to give him like I a, really enjoyed it. Like a yellow smiley sticker or something. Second book this season. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, anyway, so it's sitting there like a strange green trampoline. And this is when one of the Matsus will take a piece of split bamboo and they will scrape along the frog's legs and the sides to collect the, the poison that is now, the, once the frog's in this position, it starts secreting this you know, protective poison. This is the sapo. Oh, probably because it feels endangered in that moment. Right. Because it's kind of... Yeah, so, it's definitely being threatened. So yeah. it's definitely probably not a fun experience for the probably frog, not. I would say. Um, Levels of stress. Yeah, but again, these are people that live... Does it survive? It does. They let it go? So mm-hmm. they untie it, 
And then a snake gets it like a half second later. Because <laughs> they're in the jungle. After the, quote, milking was done, the frog was set free, and the whole village laughed and cheered as it made its way to the edge of camp Aww. and disappeared. And then the snake goes, <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I mean, it's obviously, it's a very important animal. They don't want to, they want to take care of it because this is a major, yeah, major tool for I'm sure they have for respect them. for it. But yeah. I mean, it is, you know, like. It's also the jungle. I mean, right. they, they roasted a earlier. Yeah, I was just going to say a spider monkey, spider monkey alive. alive. Yeah. You know, like, so it's, yeah. It's, you're, you're in the jungle. You don't. You're not as concerned. Like it's easier for us, in right? Our, you know, in our Mountain Dew world, yeah, in our Mountain Dew world, <laughs> <laughs> or like our, you know, uh, yeah, as we save our spiders from our shower and mosquitoes from our living or living room, well, right. ceiling fan. I mean, yeah, I don't think they probably kill things for no reason. I'm sure they right. have respect for animals. Well, yeah, they, and, they were roasting the spider monkey because they were eating it, but yeah. they obviously didn't care about its feelings. They left it alive. It's Maybe they thought alive. it'd be good for its chi or its, you know, its next life to have that challenge of being burned. Alive, <laughs> maybe. Just, I'm just kidding. Right, what, what that must smell must have been horrible. All the fur, yeah, because the fur must have still been on there. Yeah, the way it was described, it didn't sound like they were doing much skinning, and that gets even more gross. When Sorry, it audience. Comes to a sloth <laughs> that they end up cooking at some point. That's um, oh, poor sloth. Yeah, well, you know, he's not getting away. He's well, he's a part of the bio. If I've learned anything about near death experiences, it's the soul leaves the body much quicker than the body actually dies. It's the body screaming, not yeah, the sloth. It's, the it's kind of the husk at that point doing its like <laughs> their thing. husk sounds. They leave right away. Yeah. <laughs> No, no sloths left for the flames. Okay, moving along. Ah! <laughs> that's exactly what they sound like. Sloths have no fair way to get away. Yeah. They're so slow. And actually, that's really They're interesting. They're just like, oh, good. <laughs> they kind of have it coming. That's coming up in this, actually. They have about it coming. Sl- about the sloth specifically. We, we're kind of jumping. All right, let's get here. to it. I don't want to hear it. John, I'd like you to read this bit here. This I just find interesting. This I titled Mystery of Matsus Sapo Discovery. <laughs> Mm. In other words, how did they discover the sapo? Oh, yes. I bet it's a mystery. It is a mystery. The mushroom man told them. Okay. When I asked Pablo how the Matsas had learned about sapo, he said the Dao Kiet told them. That's the frog. Oh, cool. The frog told them? Awesome. Or it's also the spirit. It's also the, the slime. The medicine. It's also Dao Kiet or, or the, sapo. The spirit of the so medicine. Saying, so continue, John. It is confusing. Whether he meant the frog told them through their study of its behavior and habits, whether it told them by getting picked up by a matzis with a cut on his hand through which the sapo affected him, or whether he believed they were in communication with the frog on some level, I don't know. Interesting. So they don't really know. I bet you, yeah, someone got cut or something and yeah. had the experience and was like, oh, we could use this. Although you do wonder because, you know, they talk about, you know, with ayahuasca, how, how they've combined that root and that vine or whatever. Mm-hmm. To in Like, what are the chances of doing that? Like, you do wonder, is there some sort of like elemental force guiding people to well, discover some other kind of like thing like that where something affected them, mm-hmm. some sort of psychedelic got into their system and then they were oh, told yeah. that way. That's interesting. Yeah, oh, that's a good yeah, point. Like maybe psilocybin was like, hey, you should check out my buddy Ayahuasca over there. Yeah. Well, you just got to put these two things right. together. And they just saw them like glowing and kind of maneuvering around each other. And they're like, let's cook it. Even when you're, when you're on that level of in nature and you're so tuned in, even probably a subtle psychedelic may give you an idea. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? You think about things so Or they're just talking directly to them. I don't know. Maybe. It's interesting. I heard years ago, and I would love to get the book on this, but it's all about... Um, animal mystics like there will be a group a certain group of animals like robins for example and there'll be one robin in the flock that eats a psychedelic mushroom and then it will end up teaching strategies of hunting worms or something out of the box it'll return to its flock and then teach it i think it's a kind of macaw or something it was was all all over the animal kingdom it's not just one yeah john i'd like you to tell us how nunu works and this comes from the great book by peter gorman sapo in my soul Get it, guys. It's really worth it. It's an easy read, and it's really captivating. In that circumstance, the recipient just closes his eyes after getting the snuff. Behind closed eyelids, animals will run across your field of vision. Deer, monkeys, anteaters, tapir, small peccary, large peccary, and so forth. At a point in the vision, some of those animals will fall and die. The hunter who knows his part of the jungle very well assesses the location and the time of day depending on the sunlight and the vision, and if possible, sees how the animals died, whether by club, arrows, traps, or spears. The next day, he and others, if several animals died in the vision, go to that place ahead of time, wait for the animals to arrive, and then kill them. Yikes. (laughs) John's getting into it. John's got the hunter spirit. John's becoming the hunter. The jungle offers up the animals to them. That's right. Just like we heard in that first account. All right, Chris, tell us how Sapo works. Actually, oh, right. this is really interesting. This is how 
Sapo and Nunu work in tandem. The two together are a wonderful combination. While the Sapo, via its cleansing, sharpens your senses, the addition of Nunu adds a subtle but vital element to those sharpened senses. It's a really interesting description. The easiest way to explain it is to tell you to go outside and look at a tree with dense foliage. The foliage, even if your eyesight is fantastic, and after Sapo it is, is a sort of wall of green. But with the addition of the snuff, the hues of the foliage become very apparent. So that you find yourself not looking at a wall of green, but at a three-dimensional cluster of leaves and branches through which you can now see. The three-dimensionality allows the hunter to look into and between the branches where he might see monkeys sleeping or a bird's nest, both of which are good food in the jungle and would otherwise have been missed. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. That's superpower. Mm -hmm. A natural superpower. So these are the tools working together. You got the purging, heightening of your senses through that process. You are equipped, you're ready to go. And then the new new, which of course is you might be able to see things a little clearer. You might have a vision of where things might be. These are both key tools in the Matsus arsenal for hunting. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah. I would like to try both under shamanic supervision, of course. Okay. Now there's a really interesting element to this too, that he expresses later in the book about spirit projection. Ooh, or anima. Now that sounds shamanistic for sure. Yeah. So there's a point where Peter's down there and the Nunu's not doing a great job Hunting is very bad because the river is so high. So now, instead of hunting, it's trapping season. Oh, hunting is hard, probably harder when the river's high because of tracking is not as good. Yeah, I mean, it's swampy. It's low land, low land forests. And so, you know. Tracks being washed away. I don't know. I've never hunted in the lowlands, but I imagine something like that. Only the highlands are dry. And the animals are just, you know, they're probably more scarce because they don't want to sink in the water. <laughs> That's how hunting okay. works. Anyway, so Pablo decides... We need a tapir. It's the largest animal in the Amazon. It can feed the tribe um, for days, if not a week. It's the max amount of food you can get from an animal in the area. So in preparation for trapping the tapir, he's... Sorry, I just looked up a tapir because I couldn't remember what they look like. Oh, they're very silly. Yeah. I was picturing an anteater. I guess I wasn't far it off. It looks like an anteater. Kind it's like of. an anteater mixed with like a baby elephant. Or like a... Mixed with oh, a it donkey. Is. A hog or something. Pretty adorable. It looks... Piggy-ish. Mm -hmm. It's like a capybara. It looks like something that would have come out of like the Paleolithic era or they something. They look like they're easy to eat. Yeah. So they're the biggest animal in the jungle. In huh? the Amazon, at least in this area. Really? Mm-hmm. They don't look that big. Well, there's not really a reference in those images. They're bigger than the tiger? I don't think there's I mean, tigers. There's no in tigers. In, oh, I thought they... There's jaguars. Oh, uh, okay. Tigers are in Asia. India. Yeah. So according to the book, the tapir is the largest mammal. Oh, wow. They're pretty big. Look at that guy. Holy crap, bigger than that, that yeah. tall man there. Not, what do you mean bigger than If he tall stood man? on his hind legs, he'd be taller than the tall man. <laughs> well, how, how, how tall is the tall man? Well, look, just <laughs> tall man. Look, if you, made, if you stood up, he would be like up here. I know, but how tall is that man? Oh, good question. What if he's like 5'4"? This is the African tapir, by the way. Oh. So this is not even accurate information. <laughs> I apologize. What, what kind of tapir? <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Amazonian tapir? I don't know. Remember how we weren't going to get off course? <laughs> I know. Sorry. This is really important though. Whoa. Amazonian tapirs, also known as lowland or Brazilian tapirs, are one of the largest mammals found in South America. That's huge. Weighing in at anywhere between 350 to 600 pounds, adult tapirs have rather corp corpulent bodies. Oh, mm. that, that interesting word. I guess corporeal, very corpulent. Unusual, <laughs> very corporeal, and, very physical. I don't, I don't think that's right. Because right. cor corporeal means f a physical well, body. All animals have a very corporeal <laughs> body, <laughs> no, but it's cor corpulent because it's extra corporeal. Unusual in appearance, tapirs have thick necks, stumpy tails, and large ears. 600 pounds is, is pretty big. Okay, sorry, dear. Return to your discussion here. Okay, so Pablo's like, this is what we need. This is going to feed us for a while. So, in preparation for this, he starts mad burning himself. So, he's. He's giving himself five sapo burns each morning and night. Oh, wow. So we, we heard out how intense this was, John. And of course, he might have some tolerance built up to it. But five sapo burns each morning and night in preparation for building and executing this trap of the tapir. Pablo explained, as well as I could understand it, that sapo used in such large doses, this is really interesting, allowed a hunter to project his anima, his spirit. There it is. His trap while he slept. 
the anima would take the form of a tapir and lure a real tapir to it to mate. In the context of Pablo saying it in the middle of the jungle, it seemed reasonable. That's interesting. Yeah, so I mean, they're not alone in that tradition. I mean, that's all over the all over the globe. And so many cultures have shamanistic practices yeah. of basically astral projection. And so this is interesting. This is the sapo that's not supposed to have any kind of psychedelic or shamanistic, but apparently using so much in the pursuit of hunting in the mm-hmm. jungle, he's able to project his anima or spirit in the form of the prey that he is seeking to lure it in. That's interesting. To the trap. You know, tapirs can run 30 miles an hour. They do now. 30 miles an hour. Yeah. That's terrifying. I know. I mean, they're not very terrifying, but... They can seriously injure people. Really? That's what it said, yeah. Are they like the hip- <laughs> hippos, said, hippos yeah. of the land world? I guess. Like they're big and dangerous? They said they can also just attack without warning. Like a feral animal. They don't look like they'd be dangerous, but now the, some... Like, if you lift their little snout, they look like they have The teeth. ones in Malaysia can get up to 1,200 pounds. What? Yeah. Ouch. It's like a baby elephant. It's over half a ton. According to my knowledge of math, 200 over if you would. I will, That's crazy. Jeremy. I will. Thank you. You took the bait. Okay. So, sorry, just re- recap what you said real quickly. So, basically, he was astral projecting and using his animus, it's called his anima, his anima or anima I'm not to sure you it. lure the tapir into the trap. Yeah. It, you project your spirit in the form of the prey that you are oh, hunting. That's cool. So, that is very shamanistic. And you summon it to mate with you. Yeah. yeah and Sapo is not supposed to have these kinds of properties, especially after the. Uh, analysis done mm-hmm. scientifically with peptides and well, all that. Maybe with certain types of, you know, practice people. Yeah. And maybe enough sapo done. And in the, in the context of being in the jungle where it's, where it's home is, where mm-hmm. it was produced. Interesting stuff. Well, they're so cute. I mean, you can go back to like European folklore where you have, you know, quote unquote, witches astral projecting and transforming into animals. Right. You know, I mean, that's one example. Oh, that's interesting connection. Yeah. Uh, but in Africa, there's traditions like this astral projection into the panther. Oh yeah. Witch doctors and mm-hmm. these kinds of yeah. things. Yeah. This is, it's in, not an uncommon. It's weird that it's found in uncontacted groups around the world. Yeah. I think shamanistic practices throughout, across the earth have these kinds of, you know, projection or spirit. And we could projection. do a whole other episode on that yeah. alone, but sorry, continue. That's okay. Interesting stuff. So I'm not going to get into the details of the trap that was set, but it's a really interesting read. Again, link to the book in the description. We don't have time for it today, but it's set. The trap that is created by Pablo, expertly created and then executed by himself. He does testing, which sounds very painful of the trap. It consists of a Y-shaped branch, a trip line, a sapling, and a spike. Oh, that's right. For the death blow. But anyways, it's really interesting. So guys, definitely get the book. Check that out. But to move along with our story. Okay, this is really interesting. Speaking of sloths. Getting back to the sloths, there's a reason why they set this trap. There's an interesting rule about trapping animals. You're not allowed to hunt while you trap John. This is important for you because you're going to read this. I'm looking at the tape here, running. Okay. (laughs) He's just watching him run. There's an interesting rule that you're not allowed to hunt while you're setting traps. And there's there's an interesting reason for this. I'd like you to read this part from the book, John. As we were returning to the Pueblo, Alberto explains that traps were set only when there was no other way to get meat, because once a trap was set, no other animals could be hunted. Interesting. Mm -hmm. When I asked why, he explained that animals talk to one another and that killing them provokes their spirits, ruining the trap. (laughs) Seeing that I didn't understand, Pablo added that when he sent out his anima masquerading as a tapir, The provoked spirits would warn the prey that what it saw was not a real tapir, but a matzis anima in disguise. That's crazy. There were two exceptions to the taboo, large river turtles and sloths. The turtles could be eaten because they were so arrogant, (laughs) stupid (laughs) arrogant turtle, (laughs) that they wouldn't bother to talk to the other animals. (laughs) Jerks. I love this part. Out of my way, like, frog. Flick them off. And like, Ew, I'm a turtle. I have a big shell. I guess I could see why they would be kind yeah. of cocky. Mm-hmm. They're like, I don't even have to move fast. Exactly. Like a freaking fortress. I guess that's why they're lumping the sloths in with the turtles here. Now, the sloths, I don't understand that Well, one that's yet. coming up. Sloths could be eaten because despite them being the worst gossips in the jungle. <laughs> hey, Jeer, I'm going to tell you really slowly what Jim did. <laughs> Sloths could be eaten because despite them being the worst gossips in the jungle, they speak so slowly that by the time they say what's on their mind, the river has fallen and trapping time is over. So you are free to hunt turtles and sloths for those two great reasons. Interesting. Yeah. I love that. Speaking of sloths, even though you're trapping, you can continue to hunt the gossipy sloth. They got it coming. That evening after setting the trap, Pablo does some new new. 
And as luck would have it, he sees in his mind's eye, in his vision, three sloths, three gossipy sloths in a tree several hours up the Galvez River from Pablo's village. So the next morning, Pablo does an early dose of sapo in the morning. They take off up the river. Several hours up the river, near some huts where Pablo envisioned the sloths, there they were. Pablo had to stop our little boat. He then climbed the slender tree trunk effortlessly and got the lowest one of them down by cutting the branch from which it hung. It was a large three-toed sloth and had fell to the ground heavily. Pablo slid down the tree, found some vine, and deftly tied the angry animal's arms and legs to prevent it from attacking him with its sharp claws. The sloth hissed wildly all the way up the river. So in the book, a couple days passed during this time while they got the sloth tied up going down the river. So just to be clear, he saw these sloth ahead of time? Yeah. Pablo did? With the Nunu. Okay. And meanwhile, the trap is still set for the tapir. Hmm. And he's keeping an eye on that, a mind's eye, if you will, by continuing to do Nunu during this time. Oh, crazy. So you can actually continue the thread of your original clairvoyant vision? Yeah. So think of it like he's checking in on his like baby cam monitor where he set the tapir <laughs> trap crazy. while he's going to hunt the sloths, the That's, gossipy sloths yeah. that you can hunt. It's like having a dream and being able to go back into that same dream that you were having before. In exactly. A way. Because it's not a dream. It's the jungle telling you right. what's going on. Yeah. It's that jungle security cam he's got through the Nunu. So here in the book, the story is, goes much more in depth. They pass villages that have been burned because jaguars have tracked their scent to the village. And once man scent is caught by the jaguar, they have to burn them. So there's a lot of interesting things in this part of the story we don't have time for, but moving along to the final execution of the tapir trap after they've got the sloths and they're headed back. Within minutes of his last dose of Nunu, Pablo excitedly explained that he'd seen the tapir trap being sprung the next morning and that we had to leave immediately to get back in time to be there when it was. Otherwise, predators would get the meat. Crazy as it sounds, I took him at his word. I'd seen the new new visions work too well to doubt him. So we piled into the boat and in utter darkness, slowly made our way down the narrow Rio Galvez. We arrived at Siete de Nuno, just before dawn. Pablo woke everyone in the camp. He was insistent that we hurry. The Matzas moved through the forest effortlessly, almost at a jog. And the women chided me for having to struggle to keep up. But as we neared the trap area, Everyone stopped and grew absolutely quiet. Pablo's eyes blazed. Pedro, he whispered to me excitedly, typically mispronouncing Pedro, Spanish for Peter. Tiante, tempo de. A tapir was about to be killed. We waited about 10 minutes, then heard a sharp snap, followed by an agonizing animal scream. Everyone began running toward the sound. The wounded and disoriented tapir crashed through the brush, bellowing in pain, then fell into a stream bed where it flailed in agony. The Matzas women caught up with it, killed it, and began to cut it up. While they did, Pablo brought me to the sprung trap and gave me the bloody spike. So he was right. Mm -hmm. So the Nunu worked once again. Yep. Crazy. At least they killed it before they cut it up this time. So it did that intense amount of sapo, five burns a day, morning and night, in order to see the sloths up the river. And then all the while, snuffing the Nunu to keep an eye on the tapir trap yeah. that he had set. And when he'd seen successfully the sloths, got that guy, and then saw that the tapir trap was to be snared the next morning. So they got to get down the river. Yeah. And that's exactly when it happens. And they're there to witness it. I wonder if any stateside hunters have tried this. Like in deer season. Nunu, yeah. yeah. Oh, like, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Any of you hunters out there, I know we have some hunter listeners out there. Have you tried? I mean, yeah. I don't think it's that prevalent at this point. And in in, you know, unless you're in like California, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Let us know, guys, in the comments. We're not endorsing you, by the way. I don't want to get yelled at. Anyways, in the book, there's a lot more that gets into with his personal experience. It's interesting because Peter, you know, he's coming back to the States with this information and people aren't believing him at first mm-hmm. because they've never heard of this there have been people that have worked down there a hundred miles away or whatever that are experts on frog, frog poisons, and they hadn't heard of it. So they assumed that maybe he might be making it up. He just doesn't have the evidence. That was interesting. Yeah. It goes into all that in the book. We don't have time for it, but I did find it interesting. Some of the funny hate 
that he got. For well, I was this. just going to say that he proved them wrong. I mean, he proved that, you know, obviously wasn't making it up. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. He eventually was able to get samples. The thing is it took like, I think a couple of years before he actually got to see the frog from which the sapo was procured in the first place. Yeah. There, I think they're about three and a half to four inches big. These large, they're giant. Oh, they're that big. Frogs. Yeah. In the intro, there's a description of them being like the size of peanuts. Those mm-hmm. must be the babies. You say they're impossible not to step on. Yeah. That, that must be during like the spring or something, mm-hmm. but they're the giant green tree frogs. But it's interesting. So he's getting a lot of hate. Like people would write in and say like, bro, you're not even a scientist. You know, you don't have the right. You published this article in Penthouse. That's like where it was first published. This, you know, adventure he had down South mm-hmm. before he got funding to go back. So he was selling a story to these magazines and people were getting upset, not believing him or saying, you're not a scientist. Like you don't have basically have the authority to do this as an investigative journalist and volunteer for the Natural History Museum of New York. It shouldn't be in your wheelhouse. So people were bitter. One interesting angry comment he got was that like the photo showed a frog and you're calling it Sapo. Well, Sapo is Spanish for toad, man. So obviously you don't know what you're talking about. It's a frog, not a toad. And he even explained in his original, I think his article in Penthouse that the Matzas people didn't have a great grasp on Spanish. So they called everything Sapo, every frog, toad, you know, the same thing instead of calling it Rana, which would be frog in Spanish. So it just reminds me of a dumb YouTube comment, you know, where they don't just so many people out there, including I've done this too. I mean, everyone does it occasionally where they say something stupid, but I don't. Yeah. But there are, there's a certain type of person that likes to say stuff just to feel like they got one up on somebody. Yeah. Yeah, Especially I think when it's most frustrating, like this in his example, correcting them on a fact that he didn't get wrong. They just didn't read the whole article. Yeah. They didn't read his whole work. Just like you might listen to an episode of Beliefful and not but you won't listen to the whole thing yeah. to stop and say, well, why didn't you mention this person? You didn't even mention David Meanwhile, Politis. 45 minutes in, or, you know, 10 minutes later, you yeah. hear it's like, Dave, Dave full Politis was in the intro. What do you mean we didn't, didn't mention him? Yeah, no, some people just like to hear themselves speak. They're just grumpy bumpies, man. They don't like when people say grumpy bumpies. They also don't like yeah. that. <laughs> or when we laugh. Laughing is no fun. Anyways, the really interesting thing I thought was funny, and this goes back into like kind of academia, at times when there's a, a possessiveness of your work and of how work should be done. Two anthropologists called him apparently very upset because they had done Sapo before Peter had, but they were waiting till they retired to talk about it because as an anthropologist, you're not allowed to partake or participate in the life of the, the people, the indigenous people you're studying. Right, just observing. So they couldn't say that they'd done Sapo, so they were waiting to publish. And so Peter published before them and... Uh, yeah, of course, they're anthropologists. They couldn't risk skewing their studies, so they weren't technically allowed to. So they kept it quiet and they didn't admit it. And then, quote from the book, Peter says, I told them both that I was sorry, but that I was a journalist and my job was to participate when that was called for. Yeah. Reminds me of Gonzo journalism a little Reminds bit. Reminds me of Graham Hancock, too, a bit. Both investigative journalists who, you know, were yeah. called, you know, pseudoscientists or, you know, basically unqualified to be doing what they're doing, reporting back on things that weren't in their, I guess, main mode of study. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, he's, it's not like he knew that, that they had done it because mm-hmm. they didn't tell anybody. So it's not right. like he can't feel bad. Yeah. Like he's just trying to show right, You can probably have some empathy that like, oh, bummer, man. Yeah. He did say, I'm sorry. Yeah. But like, it's, I was a journalist, like, how am I supposed to know? And you know, the world can't wait because the rule in your field restricts you from telling anyone about it. Right. So anyways, I just thought that was kind of funny. Some of the, the hate that he got for bringing it forward. So I said, we get to the science. So I just want to briefly touch on this. So his work, after bringing some samples back and talking about it, it catches the interest of Vittorio Orspammer, if that's how you pronounce it. He was a Nobel Prize nominee, professor at the University of Rome, and credited for discovering, among other things, serotonin. Oh, you've heard of serotonin, I imagine. So pretty important figure in the work that he's doing. Anyway, so he finally is able to get a sample from Peter, who procures it from the Amazon and brings it back. And these essentially are his findings. He says, quote, the sapo was a sort of fantastic chemical cocktail with potential for medical applications. Quote, no other amphibian skin can compete with it. Wow. Up to 7% of Sapo's weight is in potentially active peptides, easily absorbed through burned, inflamed areas of the skin. He explained that among the several dozen peptides found in Sapo, seven were bioactive, meaning that each has an affinity and a selectivity for binding with receptor sites in humans. And a receptor is like a lock yeah. that when opened with the right key, the bioactive peptides trigger specific chemical reactions in the body. So the medical and therapeutic potential for what you could produce from SAPO is pretty incredible yeah. and exciting. 
Uh, where has that work gone? Well, there's been some conspiracy. <laughs> there's been some potential yeah, cover-up. any sort of development I right now? I think when he had finished the book, I think that there were some people that were still studying it, but it had kind of gone crefts and troughs, waves of of interest. And there were, there were certain issues with competing contracts and stuff. So it'd be interesting to look into where it's yeah. at now. But there are people, as we mentioned earlier in the episode, across California, the Southwest, people using it for just for therapeutic purposes, for the for the ritual, ceremonial, purging, cleansing powers of Sapo. And that gets us into the controversy regarding killer combo, killer Sapo, the deaths that have been reported linked to Sapo. Now, I think there's been like four, four or five deaths in the West or Western society, or I should say non-indigenous cultures uh, since 2008 or something like that. So Is that very often? What percentages? I don't know what, what that percentage would be. It's rare, but it has happened. People of, of different ages. Anyways, I just have a few quotes to kind of respond from actual Cambo or Sapo facilitators, their thoughts on these deaths. John, you want to read one? I think no one should be receiving combo within three days of drinking ayahuasca because the combination of the no-salt diet, exhaustion, dehydration, and electrolyte depletion puts people at risk for hyponatremia, a very avoidable yet potentially lethal condition. So this is referencing some people in these therapies or experiences would do ayahuasca right after or right before Sounds intense. taking combo or sapo. And something with the dieta or the diet, there was no salt. There's a depletion of the electrolytes. And then with all the water that's recommended that you take after or before Sapo, I think from what I understand, it creates overhydration and can be dangerous. And that, that's what one person died from, I think. Wow. So that's one of the four or five cases that we've had so far, at least when this article came out. So this next quote comes from Cambo facilitator, Benjamin Mudge. Great name. The most urgent issue that needs to be addressed, in my humble opinion, is the people are dying at Cambo ceremonies which are facilitated by non-indigenous people who are not following the traditional indigenous methodology. My argument is that the deaths are happening precisely because the traditions are being ignored. Interesting. Now, I'm sure that there are Cambo practitioners that are doing it fine that aren't indigenous. I know there's, there's a lot around the West and Southwest. John, you talked about someone that you'd seen who'd done it, facilitated the Cambo. Yeah. I didn't actually see him, but he just talked about it. And he had a good experience. I mean, what do you mean a good experience? He like, didn't die. No, he didn't die. <laughs> I'm just saying, because this, this particular... He's a practitioner, the guy that I was talking about. Yeah, but is he indigenous? No. Okay, so this, this particular comment was saying, like, it has to be indigenous, which I don't think is necessarily the case. But I do think that person should have probably been trained by an indigenous person. Yeah, I don't know what his training was, but he seems to have, like, a pretty good grasp on it. Like, he, he does it for other people, so... Right. I don't know. Everyone's going to be, like, a purist. And, yeah. It's not really possible for everyone to go down to the Amazon. Right. So that's where that's, do you obviously, you know, you have to know you're taking a risk regardless. Right. And the risk down there is that there's no hospitals or anything. Right. If something bad does happen. Yeah. You're like a three to seven hour boat ride. Yeah. So, so it's, you got it. So far, as far as we know, there's been no one that has died down there taking it indigenously. As far as we know. As far as we know. Yes, I mean, maybe, maybe the, someone's buried. They keep pretty good medical records. <laughs> yeah. Just feed them to the tapirs. Well, I think we hear if someone went missing or died, but. Well, I'm. You're talking about all of their history. No, I just meant uh, Westerners going down. Westerners going right. down. But you're right. I mean, who knows? I know that the kids take it down there, like toddlers and stuff. will take a couple hits of sapo. Really? Mm -hmm. Like there's videos of it. I mean, it, even Peter gave it to his kids. Oh, that's right. Then Peter's down there. I don't know if he's down there now, but he has like a place down there where you can go take it. So basically the idea is that it's, it's easy to avoid in a lot of these cases where deaths have occurred, which again is very rare. And this is, again, Caitlin Thompson's suggestion. She's a facilitator of Cambo or Sapo. This was her suggestion. There are a number of very simple safety protocols that make a tremendous difference in reducing the risk of accidents related to Cambo. The biggest risks of Cambo are hyponatremia and the participant potentially fainting and injuring themselves. Proper screening for complications such as heart disease, specific water protocol and education, performing a test point and assisted walking to the bathroom are the best ways that practitioners can ensure safety. These things aren't hard to do. It's just that most people administrating Cambo have no proper training and don't have any idea what the risks are to serving the medicine. Many, if not all, of the accidents associated with Cambo could have been easily prevented by having an educated and responsible practitioner. Well, good advice all around. Yeah, anyways, guys, if you want to read more on that, we'll have links in the show notes. But yeah, fascinating. If you do get your hands on some, some Sapo, use with care with someone who has experience as a practitioner and let us know how it goes. Definitely something I think I would try. I don't know if I'd survive, but I'd give it a go. <laughs> I would do it. 
All right. Oh, it was a good adventure. Thank you for taking us down the river, Jer. Yeah, I hope you guys dug it. Definitely get the book. Link will be in the show notes. Fascinating guy, fascinating story, and very interesting medicine from the uh, Matzah's people. Indeed. So, guys, I hope you had a great St. Patrick's Day a week ago. Yep. We'll see you in the expansion. Awesome. Don't miss out. And guys, we don't have time to do thank yous this week, but stay tuned. We will be getting back to more names next week. So thank you for everyone so much for your patience and for your support. Yes. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Have a good one. All right. We'll see you next time on On Belief Belief Hole. As we were returning to the Pueblo, Alberto. As we were returning to the Pueblo, Alberto. <laughs> so Welcome is, to California, Alberto. Alberto. <laughs> What's up, Alberto? <laughs> Get on that body board. Do you see the tapir? <laughs> tapir? Tapir? The tapir is swimming. He's surprisingly nimble and agile. <laughs> you wouldn't expect such a weird animal. Catch some waves, bro. So this is right after the trap is set. Do you see that tapir? Look at him run. <laughs> Good lord. Like a Canadian Californian. <laughs> it's way up north. Alberto, did you see the tape here? The way he swims, his nose sticks out of the water. <laughs> his nose. His nose. Watch him. He runs full speed and jumps into the water. <laughs> it's going all kinds of weird directions. Wait, watch. Watch him agile go. <laughs> watch him agile watch go. Watch him agile go. <laughs> Splash. The circle of life. Chris, will you explain it's to us? The wheel of fortune. <laughs> a fortune. <laughs> That's what it is. Is that the line, really? I think so. Really? Is, that, is that where they get the name for the game show? It's a dumb joke. That was a quest, serious question. How would that be a question? Yeah, Lion Cling was way after it. Lion Cling? Lion Cling. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be about needy lions. <laughs> God. Mufasa clinging on to. <laughs> These are terrible jokes. Samba. YouTube commenters are right. These jokes are terrible. Yeah, at least they're towards the end of the episode. They should be gone by now. That's true.